I'd like to welcome everybody. It's so good to see you virtually. We miss seeing you in person. Um, but look, at, we have people from Scotland and Cape Cod here. Um, so we do have a nice wide audience. And uh, if you don't know Culinary Historians of San Diego, we are a nonprofit um, who, which provides monthly uh, public lectures, free public lectures to uh, about subjects of food and drink and their roles in our society, whether it's local or global. Um, if uh, for more information, please visit our website, chsandiego.org, and uh, that will teach you, <laughs> give you more information. I've got a fire truck going by here um, about our mission, future events, and much more. Um, join us next month for a, on April 17th, where we will be welcoming Jim Chevalier, who will speak on um, the history of French food. His title is uh, uh, Feasting with the Franks. Um, so we'll move from a, a local uh, lecture today to a global lecture. Um, and as Martin says, for, your, for this Zoom presentation, uh, you may pose your questions through the Q&A button located at the bottom of your computer screen um, or, um, uh, or on the chat as Martin suggested. And um, Martin will address these at the end of his presentation. Um, we are recording this presentation uh, just so um, for those of you who are un unable to make it today or would like to see it again, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and that's Culinary Historians of San Diego. We'll get you right there. Um, it is my special pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Uh, Martin S. Lindsay is an art director, writer, speaker, and board chair of Culinary Historians of San Diego. He is the author of 90 Years of Classic San Diego Tiki. He's a contributor to Tim Ferriss' bestseller, The Four Hour Chef, and he blogs about history and food. Um, with, uh, without any uh, uh, further delay, please welcome our speaker. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be speaking again. I'm usually hosting and corralling Zoom, Zoom meetings, so it's, it's nice to be here and speak about a topic that I've uh, been researching for a, a while now. Um, I'm going to talk about the history and origins of the Caesar salad and two Caesars, and I call this the tale of two Caesars. Now we're gonna be talking about Caesar Cardini and Caesar Pastore, uh, both uh, Piedmontese um, restaurateurs and both very uh, active in the area right around here in San Diego. So without further ado, let's begin. <clears throat> All right. Who made the salad? We're going to be talking about Caesar salad. Um, Caesar made the salad. That's what I always say. Um, and it's basically just like the old TV commercials. But did he really? Many have heard the oftentimes conflicting story of the origins of Caesar salad. Uh, was it Giacomo Junio in Chicago? Caesar Cardini or his chef Livio Santini? or Caesar's brother, Alex Cardini, or any of their employees? The answer depends on who you ask and where you live. To his dying day, Caesar said he invented it at Caesar's place in Tijuana. And to his dying day, Alex Cardini, his brother, said he invented the salad at their first restaurant, which he called Alex and Caesar's, and named it after his brother. And to his dying day, Livio Santini, their chef, said he invented it while working for Caesar Cardini. And then there's um, the date problem. Giacomo Junio has said to have invented it in 1903. Caesar said 1924. Uh, Caesar's publicist said uh, 1913. Uh, Alex said 1924, then 1927 and 23. Livio Santini said 24. So what's the truth? 
Well, let me tell you, I first read stories about Cesar Cardini opening up a restaurant in San Diego, only to move to Tijuana when prohibition hit. Um, it was even quoted in articles and online and in historical websites. And many believe this one right here was Cesar Cardini's first restaurant in San Diego. And that's when I started looking into the real story. This building has been there forever and everyone knew it as Harvey Milks uh, and the City Deli before that. Uh, but before that, it was Caesar's restaurant in San Diego. Like many generations uh, growing up in San Diego, I remember Caesar's restaurants in Hillcrest, Mission Valley, Grossmont Center, in La Mesa, they even had a takeout place in Point Loma. These were popular family places and they were known for their pasta, spaghetti and ravioli, and a signature brown mushroom sauce. Although the restaurants have been gone for a number of years now, people still talk about that sauce with fond memories. Um, Caesar's restaurants were owned and operated by the Pastore family of San Diego. Uh, they didn't really have any connection to Caesar Cardini or his restaurants in Tijuana other than their names. Um, Carlo and Maria Pastore, um, this is their family. Carlo hailed from Tur Tur Turin, Torino, in the Piedmont area. Uh, he and his wife Maria uh, emigrated from Northern Italy and established their San Diego ravioli shop in about 1913. Over the years, Carlo enlisted the help of his sons, Caesar Felix Pastore, Francis Fisio Pastore, their daughter, Josephine Maria Pastore, and her husband, Carl Robert Anderson, um, to run their growing empire of Pastore's restaurant shops and markets. And they even had a winery south of the border in Baja in the early days. Uh, this is Josephine and Carl Anderson. Thank you, Trudy, for the photo. Uh, after their Baja winery burned, Carlo focused his business interests again in San Diego in anticipation of the tourist traffic from the upcoming Panama, California International Expo of 1915. He opened up the Fior d'Italia Cafe, the flower of Italy restaurant. It was downtown in the Horton Hotel building. Um, they offered fine French and Northern Italian cuisine. It was right around this time he developed his soon to be famous brown mushroom sauce. It was new to San Diego, um, but was based on traditional Piedmontese brown sauces. Uh, here's their 1917 Easter Sunday menu, six courses. You had your relish plate, soup, uh, lamb, and ravioli a la Piedmontese, which is usually traditionally a brown meat sauce. Um, roast chicken, and back then, salad after the meal. Uh, then dessert and demitasse. Uh, that building um, still exists downtown, but it's been uh, moved over to Island Avenue and now it's known as the Horton Grand Hotel. And as their business grew, um, their homemade pasta, ravioli, and sauces were a success. They advertised a lot, the uh, ravioli shop, pastores, um, when the Volstead Act was passed and outlawing the sale of alcohol, it didn't stop the Pastores any from trying to accommodate their guests. Both Carlo and his son Caesar were caught bootlegging. Uh, undercover prohibition agents found a still, barrels of mash, caches of alcohol uh, at their sunset meat market in Little Italy. Uh, Carlo got off, got off a little easier than his son, uh, claiming that he didn't know anything about what he was doing, but they were both fined uh, in the amount of $900. That was a lot back then. I love that one ad, the classified, placed in the classified section. It says, found a place that cooks real Italian ravioli and spaghetti. That's pretty cool. Uh, Alex Pass, I mean, Caesar Pastore, broke off from the family business in uh, 1928 and opened up his own place in the Hillcrest neighborhood of San Diego. 
is at that building we first saw. Uh, the Lewis Kahn building at University in Six was built in 1919 during the uh, American Egyptian revival craze, complete with friezes of the pharaohs up top. And there's still um, several Egyptian style buildings in Hillcrest around Park Boulevard. Uh, this building was remodeled to its present facade after fire to the house uh, to house a third branch of the Piggly Wiggly grocery stores chain in 1924. At the time, it's ornately carved. A vegetable freeze up top was covered in gold leaf at a cost of about $3,000. While the pastores were there, they kept it at its most pristine. And it's now painted over. Uh, oh, here's the interior. Uh, right after they open. Look at all those flowers, congratulations. And also the deli case over there for takeout. Uh, Caesar's restaurant uh, featured his family's well-known ravioli dishes with brown mushroom sauce, homemade spaghetti and tagliarini. A popular specialty was their half and half, uh, equal portions of spaghetti and ravioli or tagliarini on the same plate topped with grated imported cheese. From the beginning, they sold their pasta to go and were open past midnight. So it was a popular spot. Here's a combo menu from 1940. Uh, they have Caesars and Pastore's restaurants on the front there. Um, when he entered the Marine Corps in 1942, Caesar Pastore sold his business to his brother Francis and brother-in-law Carl. Uh, he left the service later uh, in 46 as a major, and by late 1940s, uh, Caesar was a co-owner and major stockholder in the San Diego Padres Baseball Club. Here's the interior uh, of that menu. Frank ran the restaurant for years and finally convinced his son Robert to take over. Over the years, the place was modernized. Original wooden booths were replaced uh, by swanky turquoise naga hide and the original travertine floors were covered up. Turquoise and green became the colors that they used on all the menus. And on any, on any uh, Friday night in the 1960s, you could find a lobby loaded with customers waiting for takeout orders, which accounted for about 25% of their business. For those dining in, there were lines out the door. People were given numbers for seating, including all the movers and shakers. Um, a lot of them <clears throat> got takeout or they sat down to enjoy specials like here, uh, liver and onions, sweetbreads, pastrami, stuffed cabbage, ox joints, uh, short ribs, local beers made in San Diego. They have ABC beer there. Acme beer, San Diego beer. Um, Robert told me the story of Fred Rohr of Rohr Industries haphazardly bumping into Claude Ryan of Ryan Aeronautical in the lobby. They were both waiting for their to-go orders. And while they were waiting, their wives were driving around the block waiting for them because as any San Diego knows, parking was bad in Hillcrest. In those days, and even today, some things never change, right? Uh, here's their um, original recipe book with the, uh, with the recipe for the, their ravioli sauce. Caesar's brown mushroom sauce is based on Espanol, or Spanish sauce, one of the five mother sauces of French cooking. It's also based on Piedmontese um, sauces. Uh, the secret was slowly caramelizing onions until they imparted a rich brown color and sweet flavor. A ton of a ton of onions, and they used imported dried porcini mushrooms, um, ground smoked nicam. Local beef was brought uh, was bought in uh, primal cuts from Cudahy Meats in Mission Valley, San Diego. Francis was trained as a butcher. So they used those primal cuts for everything. Uh, Mission Valley used to be pasture land. 
and they had fresh beef from the valley local. Uh, but it started to uh, be developed with hotels and shopping centers, and now it's mostly condos. No more cows in Mission Valley. Everything was used. Uh, the scraps and bones were used for making beef stock from scratch uh, for uh, the sauce uh, for the sauces. Uh, Robert remembers uh, as a child coming into the kitchen and seeing the huge stock pots simmering away at all hours of the night. The sauce was strained and thickened with cornstarch, making it smooth, almost like a brown gravy. I tried to recreate that recipe in smaller quantities for the home cook. Some people like it. Some people said it didn't quite match up to what they remembered. It's always impossible to try and recreate a recipe from one of those huge recipes, but also from different ingredients, modern, that are different than what they used before. Uh, the recipe is posted online at the Culinary Historians of San Diego's website, chsandiego.org and on my site, classicsandiego.com, if you want to try it out. I'll also be posting some of the Caesar salad recipes uh, later on today on both of those sites. Then there's a story about George Pernicano, who ran Pernicano's Casa de Buffy restaurant next door to Caesar's. Casa de Buffy, house of the mustache. He actually had his mustache uh, insured for $100,000, so it was said. Apparently, George was sometimes uh, very excitable. He got into a fist fight one time before with a health inspector that uh, apparently he did not agree with. So one day, uh, another inspector came into Caesar's kitchen to give it the once over. And Bob thought, well, it's only a matter of time before he goes over next door to his next inspection. So they sent a bus boy out the back door through the alley into Pernicano's where George's staff called a cab and spirited him away before any other harm happened. Another, avoiding another fight and they both got a passing grade. Um, after nearly four decades in business, Caesars opened a small takeout location in Point Loma calling it Little Caesars uh, at Rosecrans and Harbor Drive. And it was popular for quite a while, for a while until um, the Detroit-based pizza chain, Little Caesars, objected. And so they moved on. Bob and his wife, Diane Pastore, designed and built a larger Grossmont Center location uh, from the ground up. New kitchen, uh, had its own bakery where they could supply all of their locations. Here's the combo menu uh, from this and their Mission Valley location on uh, top, top uh, drawing shows the Grossmont location on the bottom is the Mission Valley location. Um, Caesars Mission Valley is in the Mission Valley Center West shopping center. Originally it was a Valley Ho restaurant. Um, in 1971 they, they bought it and remodeled it into um, Caesars. The Valley Ho had originally been built by George DeVos as a showstopper of unique style. It's not quite goji, but it's quite interesting. It included the Camelot Lounge, which could uh, also accommodate large parties, which is just what they needed. And it had plenty of parking, unlike the Hillcrest location. Uh, this is the interior, quite ornate. And here is a cover of the old menu. They had uh, a putting green installed out front for the kids. Although Bob Pastore, being a semi-professional golfer, uh, golfer liked it just as well. And as I was told, no windows were broken. They sold Caesars Hillcrest and it became Cavaliere's. Uh, serving the same menu. Then the summer place up until 1984, uh, City Delicatessen uh, Bakery for almost 30 years, and Harvey Milk's American Diner. It's now a hair salon. And um, that's the story of one San Diego Caesar. What is a Caesar's salad? 
Today it's known as a traditional but fancy Italian Mexican salad made with leaf lettuce as opposed to a head lettuce, preferably crafted con mucho gusto and flourished by an experienced ensaladero salad maker. Right in front of your eyes, a la minute, as they'd say. This is Alejandro Cesar Cardini III at Caesar's Restaurant. This is from a couple of years ago when I went down there. He's the grandson of Alex Cardini and grand nephew of Caesar Cardini. And this was the first time in over 84 years or so that a Cardini had cooked in the restaurant since Caesar Cardini left in the 30s. That was a good evening. And you'll notice all the other insuladeros are watching the master here make, make the salad traditionally as his, his family did. What goes in it though? Romaine lettuce, we know, right? Cost lettuce or romaine or romano. Um, some garlic, ingredients of mayonnaise, eggs, oil, and an acid such as citrus. It was, um, what we would call a Roman tradition, it was born out of the Roman tradition. Some fish sauce for flavor. This here that you'll see is uh, um, the um, art of cooking, de re cocinaria, uh, attributed to uh, Marcus Gaius Apicus, Apicius, Apicus, I always say Apicus, um, in the first century. Uh, it's basically considered the first published cookbook, but others, others have been uh, found. Um, this one here is not the newest, I mean, not the oldest. This is a midnight ninth century edition. Uh, uh, Apicus was a Roman merchant foodie, and it contains over 400 recipes collected over several hundred years. So they kept adding to it in different various versions. But what's interesting about it is it includes, includes recipes for garum, which is a fish sauce. Uh, in, other, in other cuisines, it's an op chow or nam pla, but in Roman cookery, they used liquamen or garum as a traditional um, fish sauce used for seasoning instead of salt. Uh, garum was basically rotten fish with herbs, fermented for long periods of time in large vessels. And there were many types and qualities of garum available uh, in ancient Rome, uh, made with different types of fish, varying degrees of stinkiness and salinity. There were artisanal garums. Uh, there were, some were sweetened with honey and some with wine. And it's interesting to note, note that uh, out of these same methods were developed for mass production, production in 1937 by two chemists, John Wheely Lee and William Henry Perrins. They were commissioned to uh, make this sauce that a man had found in Asia. Uh, their first batch was rejected as terrible and sat in their basement for years before they rediscovered it. Uh, but by then, it was delicious and fermented and aged in the oak barrels. It was great. Um, this is Lee and Perrins a while ago. And as you can see, they are doing the same thing, aging, aging their fish sauce in barrels. Lee and Perrins Company of Worcestershire, Worcestershire, or let's just say Worcester, England, still produces Worcester sauce used today in Caesar salad. It's also called salsa ingles in Spanish. Over 40 million bottles a year are produced. Garlic and anchovies are aged separately in barrels, 18 months before being combined with other ingredients and spices to make the sauce. And I might also know that in Northern Italy, there are other traditions of other salads and dishes using these same ingredients like banya cauda. Uh, it's an anchovy dipping sauce. Uh, so Caesar salad comes out of what I like to call the Roman tradition. There are foundations of that invention. Caesar's salad. Let's look at the oldest uh, claimant, Giacomo Junior, 1903. 
True or false, in 1903, Chef Giacomo Junia, an Italian immigrant, invented the Caesar salad at his restaurant in the New York Cafe in Chicago and named it after the Roman emperor. What do you think? False. The myth of Giacomo Junio comes from a cookbook by a, by a tall tale telling curmudgeon, lazy reporting, and an aggregation of published errors. In 2003, uh, Rosa Cardini's obituary briefly repeated the family story of her father, Caesar's namesake salad, as to its invention. Most credit Caesar Cardini with the classic version, wrote the obituary columnist Mary O'Rourke. With, but others say it was the Chicago-based chef Giacomo Junior. So Rosa Cardini's uh, obituary from the LA Times was nationally syndicated and put in press throughout print and thus lending veracity to the dubious claim. Other nationally syndicated news articles quoted Webster's New World Dictionary, which also picked up that story about Giacomo Junio. It comes from this guy, George Leonard, Leonard Herter. He wrote a book, a book called Bull Cook and Authentic Historical Recipes and Practices. It was a self-published uh, by this odd know-it-all, George Leonard Herter in 1961. Herter was a proprietor of Herter's Outdoor Sporting Goods stores in Waseca, Minnesota. It was the epitome of the opinionated gun-toting American entrepreneur. Pretty loose with the facts, but no worries. He was long on tall tales. It was a couple pages from one of his mail order catalogs. Herter's ancient wood decoys, Herter's fashionable shirts for all seasons. His aptly titled book, Bull Cook, is a loosely structured compilation of wild game recipes, fabricated culinary history, and brutal restaurant reviews. It truly is a lot of bull cooked. Like, for instance, the Virgin Mary, favorite cream spinach, Charlemagne invented sauerbraten, Swedish muskrats are delicious, Johannes Kepler created liverwurst. Herder loved the food of New Orleans, but hated restaurants on the West Coast. In Tijuana, a waste of time, in quotes. And Hollywood, don't get him started on Hollywood. Herder authored more than several of these popular how-to books, sold at his store and through well-established mail order businesses that he ran, um, including of the book he entitled Living with a Bitch. I hope his wife Bertha exacted retribution for that. His recipe for Caesar salad includes a history of cost lettuce, but also includes fried bacon, fried in a deep fryer. He also says to deep fry the romaine lettuce in beef suet until it's wilted. And don't use olive oil, it smokes too much. Uh, don't use Parmesan. It's too gritty. He was grated cheese instead. It's a mess. So I think without further ado, we can discount him, uh, Giacomo Junio. Also, research shows that there's no Giacomo Junio in any of the censuses or the city directories or the newspapers. There's nothing on the guy. Let's move on to the Cardini's Caesar salad. Uh, after many years on and off, um, Together in business, the Cardinis went their separate ways in the 30s, uh, making clarification of who actually invented it more difficult. In his later years, Alex Cardini offered a thousand dollar reward if anyone could prove him wrong that he invented it. Albeit after Caesar died, uh, Caesar's daughter Rosa took him up on it, uh, and it was a blood feud in the press. Uh, with the Californians siding on, on the side of Caesar and the Texans siding with Alex. Caesar's restaurant in uh, Tijuana now today, today uh, gives both Caesar and Alex credit and they include Caesar's chef Livio Santini as well. Um, tradition says Caesar invented the salad at his place in Tijuana 
on Independence Day weekend in 1924. Uh, there were rumors that the Mexican government was going to shut down all businesses that weekend for the Mexico's elections. Uh, but businessmen rallied and they made an exception for Tijuana. So business was super busy on that weekend. Um, business owners placed ads the whole week before assuring Californians that Tijuana would be indeed open for business as usual. Uh, Cesar Cardini, he was christened Abelardo Cesare Cardini. He was born in Baveno, Baveno in the Novara region of Pima, which is Northern Italy. He was the second son of six children born in Giacomo and Carolina, Cardina, Cardini. Uh, they had Rosina, Nero, Carlotta, Cesare, Gaudenzio, and Alex Cardini. Uh, and two sons from his first marriage, Bonacio, Bonifacio and Aldo, um, and, Car and Carlotta. Uh, Cesar's father was an ironsmith. His brothers, Nero, and Godenzio were stonecutters at the nearby quarry. This is Alex and Caesar in, in Tijuana when they first got there in the mid 20s. Baveno, Baveno was a resort town on the shores of Lago Maggiore. A lot of different places there, hotels, restaurants and stuff. Perfect place to learn the business. From an early age, Caesar and his brothers Nero and Godenzio and Alessandro, Alex, uh, worked in the hotels. Uh, trained in the bustling kitchens of Europe, moved on around in Europe and did that. And Alex actually went in the restaurant business, he said, when he was 10 years old. Here's some travel posters. And uh, here's uh, one of the grand hotels there. You could get a job there or uh, working for one of your uh, Cardini relatives in a tin toy factory or uh, working uh, or risking silicosis, actually, uh, often diagnosed as pulmonary tuberculosis if you were going to be working in the dusty granite quarries where they use pneumatic drills. Um, or you could get a job working at one of the spas. This is Stresa, um, serving up arsenical bubbly water. Yes, this is true. Arsenic uh, was considered to be beneficial to one's health, at least at this place. Well, before the 1912 summer hotel season began in earnest, Caesar escaped that future and he booked contract packet passage on the SS Corsican from Liverpool to Montreal with five other local teenagers. At that time, there were a number of ways to get to America, the American continent, and one of them was as a paid seasonal immigrant worker. British ticket agents would often employ runners to solicit prospects uh, uh, at steamship landings. Some of these agents had profitable relationships with hotels across the pond. Like, for example, in exchange for booking seasonal workers, the ticket agent would get a finder's fee from the hotel. But well, the hotel would pay the passengers travel expenses in exchange for their contractual binding work. It's a great way to get cheap young help. Here's actually a brochure for the Windsor with the uh, steamship agent's name on it. Uh, so when they landed, Cardini and over 20 other young men released by the steamship company um, went to the Windsor Hotel to work. Located just over the Canadian border, it catered to travelers and tourists from the United States. It was a big operation, uh, required scores of employees to keep things running smoothly. The Windsor boasted over 750 rooms, two ballrooms, a concert hall, six restaurants, including the grill room for men, the ladies' cafe with their own special interest, uh, and the rose room. It was called that uh, for the color of its decor. Uh, the lower level, in the lower level, was the wine room, a man-only bar with ornate vaulted ceilings. It's kind of easy to see how a 17-year-old must have dreamed of having his own resort hotel with a fancy restaurant and bar and entertainment. 
And in less than 20 years, Caesar would achieve that. After six months of hotel work, he triumphantly returned home. Uh, the $5 in his pockets had grown to 80. A uh, little more than six months later, he returned with his brother Nero. He traveled to New York and uh, Nero went to Bar, Vermont at the invitation of their uncles, Angelo and Antonio Cardini. Uh, their uncles, like thousands of other Italian and Scottish immigrants, had settled in Bar as quarry workers with, with its bustling granite sheds or, or factories. He did that for a while, and then he moved away from the quarries of Vermont uh, to California, where Nero uh, bought a small hotel uh, near the Santa Cruz Casino and Boardwalk. Uh, and he advertised the finest Italian dinners and bocce ball that one could have. Uh, Caesar actually went back to Canada and worked his way across Canada through Montreal, Ottawa, Victoria, learning the front of the house jobs. And he ultimately wound up in San Francisco uh, at the newly rebuilt Palace Hotel in 1919. They were still rebuilding from the 1906 earthquake. The new palace uh, was a height of luxury at the time. Lunch in the grill room was for men only, but the Grand Hotel's main dining room, uh, the 900 seat Palace Palm Court seen here, sat in the middle where one could be seen. Center stage, tuxedo clad waiters, served an average of about 2,500 lunches a day. Afternoon tea was from three to five with live music, sometimes with dancing, tea descent, as they called it. According, uh, adjoining uh, the Palm Court was the Rose Room, which added capacity for another 600. Hungry souls, cuisine and service were closely overseen, always top notch and advertised as such. Palace cuisine is a dynamo of luxurious well-being and contentment. And this is where he worked. Uh, surviving hotel records that I could find from this period show uh, dozens of Italian and German men employed at the palace as waiters, including Caesar Cardini um, and his future business partners, Hungarian-born William Brown, and fellow Northern Italian Giuseppe Ferraris, or Joe Ferraris, or Ferrari, so he went by sometimes. Uh, Joe Ferrari uh, would be his partner in Hotel Caesars. They started making business connections uh, and meeting people in San Francisco. And then they decided to go out on their own. Caesar and Brown left the palace with funding from Brown's uh, father-in-law and opened a restaurant of their own in Sacramento in December of 1919. Their new dine dance eatery, Brown's Restaurant, took the place of the Orient or Oriental Grill um, as a chop suey restaurant on K Street, which was the center of the state's, uh, state capital's business district at the time, a few blocks south of City Hall. They catered to the businessmen's crowd, offering a merchant lunch, like soup, fish or entree, dessert, drink for 50 cents. Uh, one ad said, the men who conduct Browns were formerly at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, and they know how. Nightly dinners with chicken on Sundays were served with delightful jazz music, as the ads went on Saturdays and Sundays, and what a present. Um, City Council granted their dance permit on Christmas Eve, 1919. Unfortunately, that was kind of bad timing. A uh, third wave of the Spanish influenza pandemic was raging throughout the world right then, spread by the return of infected servicemen from World War I. And in two years, it claimed the lives of over 40 million people worldwide and 675,000 people in the United States. Municipalities suggested families avoid public places, shopping, restaurants and bars. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Not only that, there was the eminent enactment of prohibition. Even though it was coming, many California uh, restaurateurs 
were secretly hoping, and even publicly, that uh, the government would allow serving of alcohol, at least in uh, light wines and beers. But the Sacramento bureaucrats hammered all the businesses serving alcohol with mass liquor uh, cancellations, liquor license cancellations. Uh, there was like 32 in one day. Brown's restaurant closed after he uh, declared bankruptcy, owing some $7,300 to creditors. He lost his liquor license, and both he and Caesar were sued by their landlord. Uh, what did Caesar do? He fled to Italy, where he had a chance to regroup and check in on his little brother, Alex. Uh, we're going to switch to Paul Della Maggiora, who was a partner with the Cardinis in several of their businesses. Uh, when he moved from Tijuana in the 30s, again, he brought with him his own version of Caesar's salad, which he called Paul's Romaine Salad, up to Los Angeles. Paul Peter Della Maggiora uh, was born in San Diego to hoteliers Angelo and Alma Della Maggiora, and their family came from the Rafancore wine country in Piemont, another Northern Italian. Uh, Angelo, his, his father, and, and his brother, John Majora, settled in San Diego and bought a boarding house on the corner of Sixth and Island down in the Gaslamp Quarter. A restaurant bar was on the ground level with living quarters, they called it, uh, up on the top level. And they called their place the Tuscan House. Um, today, it's still in business, but now, now known as the Tivoli. Uh, Paul grew up in San Diego and worked at that, that place, his father's infamous saloon. It had a colorful past being in the Stingery District, which was the adult entertainment district of downtown. There was an active brothel upstairs. And uh, interesting types like the retired Wyatt Earp used to hang out there. Um, the Tivoli Bar and Grill was the oldest bar. That was in the 1880s. Um, the Tivoli Bar and Grill is the oldest in San Diego, followed by the, the Waterfront Bar, which has the oldest continual liquor license in town. If you go there today, the original wooden bar and cash register are there. So he moved from San Diego and went to the LA area. He lived in Tended Bar in 1910 uh, at the Mount Low Resort, north of Pasadena, up in the mountains. It was quite popular and one of the most visited attractions in Los Angeles at the time. Guests rode the very steep Pacific Electric Railway to the summit of Mount Low, where the Alpine Tavern Hotel, restaurant, and rental cottages were located. The tavern was a Swiss chalet style lodge built on a granite foundation surrounded by pine, spruce, and black oak trees. It featured a dining room with a view uh, that sees at 200 and was the staycation place to visit for incredible views of the valley. Hunting, hiking, tennis, and relaxation. Majora embraced, embraced what, what we call that Teddy Roosevelt strenuous lifestyle and later would incorporate the hunting lodge motif um, in his restaurants, right down to offering wild game, pheasant, duck, and venison dishes. When he went into business with Alex Cardini, um, one of their standards was wild duck a la presse, prepared tableside on a rolling cart, which would uh, later feature in the presentation of their salads. All that reigns uh, today of the resort are the building's foundations, which you can reach by hiking trails. By 1917, Paul had come down from the mountains to the cultural center of Los Angeles' Italian community, Venice of America. The area was established by Abbott Kinney as a recreation of Venice, Italy, right down to its canals. Majora took a job as bartender for Caesar Minotti at Minotti's Buffet, now called the Townhouse Bar. Um, when Prohibition was enacted, Minotti converted the business to the Venice Grocery Store. 
uh, but moved the bar into the basement secretly. Uh, he supplied what he called his Del Monte speakeasy, uh, also hotels and other establish establishments around the area via secret tunnels from the underneath the Abbot Kinney Pier to his place where he received shipments from Canada. Uh, Majora moved back to San Diego, helping out with his family's businesses. And he unsuccessfully tried the Minotti business plan and was prosecuted for the theft of 72 cases of whiskey in San Diego. And in 1921, he was arrested again for selling whiskey from his soft drink stand in San Diego. You know, it was obviously time for a change. So he went down to Tijuana. So Alex Cardini, uh, there's the Alex Caesar Cardini salad, uh, known as Alessandro to his family, Alejandro to his compadres in Mexico, and simply as Alex to the many Americans who visited Tijuana. Alex, in my humble opinion, turned out to be a better chef and more successful businessman than his older brother, Caesar. His restaurants were better reviewed, well reviewed, and lasted longer as his career as a restaurateur. Um, some have discounted this, this success and even the fact that he was an aviator. Uh, but, you know, people just want to believe what they want to believe. In 1921, he was released from the aviator Depo Alto of the Italian army. Um, so he was in the army and he was uh, in, in, in the Air Force there. Well, they called it the Depo Alto of the army. Alex was decorated pilot uh, during and after the war. His adventures in the Italian Army Corps um, would later attract a military clientele to his restaurants. So much so that he named his aviator salad uh, in honor of the Air Corps pilots from Rockwell Field, Coronado, now known as the Naval Air Station, North Island. The political climate in Italy at that time grew continually more unsteady after riots and strikes. Um, oops, after riots and strikes, uh, the National uh, Fascist Party took control of the country. Carditi left Italy. Alex didn't need no fascist groove thing, as the song goes. Uh, he made several trips back and forth across, across the Atlantic as a waiter on the RMS Olympic, uh, saving his money. Uh, it was a sister ship of the Titanic. Alex's time aboard uh, ironically mirrors Caesar's uh, at the Palace Hotel. The ship uh, was a large and luxurious cruise ship. It had luxury dining rooms. Here's their formal dining room and a Palm Court restaurant of its own. Uh, so, prohibition, the enactment of America's noble experiment, the Volstead Act criminalized the manufacturer buying, selling, consumption of alcohol. Italian uh, winemakers who settled in the US were effectively forced out of business when prohibition was enacted. Throughout the country, vineyards, wineries, breweries, liquor stores, and bars immediately were closed. They went out of business. Established vineyards were abandoned over the four next 14 years with only a handful uh, continuing to operate by producing sacramental wines for the church. Restaurants like grapes died on the vine. A few savvy vintners like Victor Delu and the Marchetti families shipped their wine south in Baja for storage or grapes for fermenting while they waited it out. But in Tijuana, business there flourished. The opportunities uh, or for maximum prof profitability, if an entrepreneur could secure us a spot were great. Sizable group of Italians converged on Tijuana for its unrestricted business, easy access to imported wine and liquor, including the Pastore family, uh, Baja Vineyards, and they had Pastores and Caesars in San Diego, the Cardini brothers, Giovanni Cano Casigio, and the Card Cardinelli brothers from Cardinelli Beer, uh, the Majora family, who also ran the Aloha Cafe Tiki Bar, uh, Fior di Italia, and the Tivoli in San Diego, the Mirabile brothers, 
around midnight fallings and were allegedly associated with the mob. Uh, Pharaoh Pagliai uh, from the Agua Caliente Resort. Um, these are a few. It was estimated uh, that Italian chefs offered on their menus more than a hundred types of fish, shellfish and game animals, venison, filet, quail, pheasant, duck a la press at Paul's, uh, viper stew at the Foreign Club, pigeon at San Francisco restaurant, and even bear steak at the Caliente racetrack. And millions of tourists followed, hoping to have a grand time in Satan's playground. This is an actual photograph of the road somebody put, uh, painted on the, on the highway going down to Tijuana. Uh, and we talked about racetracks. Uh, horse racing season started in Thanksgiving uh, 1921 and it was expected to attract huge crowds. And all these Italian guys that I've been talking about started converging down there right around that time. It was a big deal. Tijuana was the first, Tijuana was the first to modernize horse racing with its electric starting gates, uh, photo finish camera, Sunday racing, large purses of up to $100,000, the calling of races on a public address system, and wetting the track by sprinkler car. Here's a photo of the bridge to Tijuana, uh, also called La Marimba because of the sound the planks made as you traveled over it in your flivver. Also, bullfights were in full swing. The bars, cantinas, restaurants, and brothels were hop, all hopping busy. Uh, one night in December, though, a third of Tijuana's uh, business district burned down to the ground. Business owners busied themselves the next day, the very next day, rebuilding new amusement centers popped up seemingly overnight. Tijuana, it was said, was a boomtown rising again and again out of the ashes like a golden phoenix reborn. And that's where they went. After landing in New York, Alex Cardini made his way meeting Caesar sometime around 1922. Uh, Alex recounted in 1967 that he and Caesar started up a small restaurant in Tijuana which he called Alex and Caesars. Whether they banded together at first or opened their own places, I uh, don't know. Further research must be done. But um, Caesar did get a job as a waiter first at the American Hotel, which you see on the right. And then a couple doors down on the left is Caesar's place, his first, first place of his own. Livio Santini, Livio also said he invented the salad. Livio Santini no more was born in Dro, Trento, Northern Italy. Uh, during World War I, it was occupied by the Austrians. As a child, Livio grew up in the mountainous Trentino area, occupied again, like I said, by Australia, Australia, Austria, uh, right on the border and right in the middle of the fighting. Um, up until he was eight or nine, his hometown had been occupied, impoverished, and decimated. His father was conscripted as a soldier to Austria. They lived on a farm in Bruno Sulima, Austrian territory. He sat about three kilometers from Hitler's house. They settled in one of the large stables of the farm where his mother would fix guisos, dishes or stews, with the ingredients that would one day, when combined, become Caesar's salad. After the war, Northern Italy experienced financial depression and slow rebuilding. Here you can see some of the bombed out buildings of his area and uh, the poor living conditions. Like I said, fascism was on the rise. Uh, and just as he was becoming an adult, like Alex Cardini, he wanted to get out of that area. He heard through the church there was work for Italians in Mexico. So at the age of 17, he traveled to Mexico, invited by an Italian priest to, who owned a farm in El Bajio near Guadalajara. 
There, there was work. It was hard work in a hot climate, which he was not uh, used to. He was used to the mountains. In addition to work, there was also malaria and other diseases. Uh, then he heard about Baja, California, where the climate was very similar to the Mediterranean. So he said, sign me up. In an interview from his later years, Lydia said that when he arrived in Tijuana, uh, he couldn't believe it. There were, there were uh, limousines and rich people and people spending money like crazy. He, he said in this interview that he arrived December 29th, 1924, and started washing dishes at Caesar's Place on 2nd Avenue, just two doors west from the Callejon Trevieso, the Devil's Alley. He worked his way out to Cocinero Segundo, the second chef. Um, from this interview, though, is a little problematic because December 29th is after the July 4th, uh, invention date that he later says. So his dates move around depending on his age and his interviews. So take that with a grain of salt. Uncle Jack Clapp, uh, he had the Jack salad or the Jack Romaine salad. Stone Joseph Jack Clapp was born in Donaldsville, Donaldsonville, um, just on the banks of the Mississippi in Southern Louisiana. A well-natured, extroverted, good old Southern boy. He was born for the service industry. From the time he was a lanky teenager up until the day he died, he was a waiter, captain, mater D in the restaurant tour. He started waiting in Springfield, Missouri and moved west to Colorado Springs, got married, got divorced, then found his way to San Diego in the twenties. And guess where he went? He got a job waiting tables at Caesar's place in Tijuana. Uh, he, there he learned to make Caesar's salad, uh, which he would make his own specialty later on. At Caesar's place, he met and worked with the chef Livio Santini. Um, in 1928, Mariano Escobedo, a wealthy real estate holder in Tijuana, asked Santini if he'd like to take over and run the cafe in his California hotel. A brand new hotel that was just around the block from Caesars. The California cafe was the only big uh, new hotel and cafe in Tijuana at the time with a casino, a bar, floor shows. Escobedo offered um, him a concession rent free. Santini took him up on it uh, and took with him Jack Clapp as a partner and probably more than a few others. There he is, Livio Santini, and just behind him is a very young Jack Clapp partners. It's unclear how Cesar Cardini took this emigration from his restaurant or if it was negotiated with Escobedo, I don't know. But at the time, Caesar and his brother were both operating separate restaurants. Uh, after Livio and Clapp's partnership ended, Clapp apparently returned to Caesar and his various restaurants up until 1936 when Cardini quit Tijuana. Uh, Livio went on to uh, found his own restaurant and hotel and had restaurants in Tijuana for years and years and years and years. This view here shows the California Hotel on the left right here. And over here, there's the Domino Hotel, which was the rebuilt American Hotel. Uh, Caesar actually had something to do with the rebuilding after a fire. And over here, this sign here is Vic's Cafe. Vic's Cafe was the Victor Delu that I talked about earlier, who had the wineries. Uh, here's a menu from 1952 from the California cafe. It doesn't have Caesar salad on it, but it does have Spanish spaghetti. 1938, Jack moved back up to uh, America. I worked at George's Rendezvous uh, in Coronado, and then also took a job as a major D at the El Cordova Cafe. Uh, it was advertised that that Jack Clapp, an associate of a business partner of Caesar Cardini, uh, was bringing the salad to them 
And if you've ever been to uh, Coronado, you'll know the El, Cordo El Cordova Hotel is still there. It's a great little boutique a hotel still in business and it's just right across the street from the Hotel Del Coronado. So after that, he moved to La Avenida restaurant, um, Albert Brahms La Avenida restaurant. Uh, and he moved bringing with him his famous original Caesar salad. The extroverted Mater D would often sing while uh, diners watched him toss that salad. Uh, here he is on the left-hand side offering a woman who does not want her photograph being taken some food. Among Claps admirers were hundreds of retired Navy personnel who lived on Coronado and movie stars traveling to Mexico. Although Clapp never denied um, reports giving him credit for its invention, out of respect for Cardini, he did call his version the Jack Romaine salad. The restaurant opened a newly built Spanish style uh, building that was designed and constructed by Walter Vestal. Uh, it featured murals by Mexican modernist painter Alfredo Ramos Martinez, who was commissioned by Albert Brom to paint murals, those murals that would become the focal points of the restaurant. They're no longer there. The restaurant's been totally, uh, the building's been totally remodeled, but you can see the murals which were saved and restored now on public view at the Coronado Public Library. And they're beautiful. So around 1922-24, they were all there in Tijuana. After landing, um, after landing in, uh, in Tijuana, this is where they all uh, converge one way or another. It's traditionally believed uh, that Caesar's salad was first served on July 4th, 1924. Most, whether enthusiastically or begrudgingly, agreed that it was right around this time. Over the years, though, memories have faded and egos have inflated. Uh, there are now more than several scenarios, claimants and alleged progenitors of that salad. But in 1925-26, a Pasadena real estate investor named John McWilliams Jr. visited Tijuana with his family, where they dined at this place, Caesar's place. Uh, uh, my parents, of course, ordered the salad, their daughter remembered many years later. Uh, Caesar himself rolled the big car up to the table, tossed the romaine in a great wooden bowl, and I wish I could say I remembered his every move, but I don't. The only thing I see again clearly is the eggs. I can see him break two eggs over that romaine and roll them in, the greens going all creamy as the eggs float over them. Two eggs in a salad, two one-minute coddled eggs and garlic-flavored croutons and grated Parmesan cheese. It was a sensation of a salad from coast to coast. And that girl was Julia Child. So she does remember having it that early there at Caesar's Palace or Caesar's Place, I should say. Hotel Commercial, Miguel Gonzalez of uh, the Compañía Comercial de Baja California, our commercial California company, built the first of his hotel commercials in Ensenada. His father-in-law was a San Diego business leader, George Ibs, who owned land in Tijuana's uh, business district through this through his company, uh, Miguel operated the family's hotels, curio stores, and bars, including Mexicali Brewing Company and La Ballena Long Bar. His big curio store, originally built in 1987, was at one time the oldest building in Tijuana until it burned down. Gonzalez borrowed liberally from the success of San Francisco's famous Italian restaurant, Fior di Italia, which we mentioned before in name, uh, Fiore Italia in San Francisco is apparently its oldest restaurant. He, he opened uh, a restaurant of the same name in his new Ensenada hotel. Like many Italian, like like-minded like Italians that did the same, uh, he named it Fiore Italia. Uh, Fiore Italia Ensenada 
was run by uh, Salvador Carlotti and a Frenchman named Eugenio Fabre until they ended their tempestuous relationship in a deadly encounter at the Ben-Hur bar in Tijuana. Now one of them died, one of them went to prison. Gonzalez lost his big curio store in the Tijuana fire of 1926 and quickly planned to rebuild it. A new hotel on the northwest corner of South and Main, second in Maine, uh, now called Calle Benito Juarez and Avenida Revolución. It incorporated the curio store on a street level retail space and hotel commercial was first proposed and designed by Hansen and Swearingen architects of San Diego. It's gonna be three stories as you can see there. Uh, unfortunately, it only made it to one story and that building is still there. It's a HSBC bank at the, at the moment. Um, but then in 1927, after this was built, another fire raged for Tijuana and raised some of his other businesses. So he decided to take the top design portion and create, you know, he already paid for it, and use it for this building, the Hotel Commercial. Uh, it was awarded, the, the actual building and design was awarded to San Diego architect Frank M. Stevenson, who uh, did the Ensenada Hotel commercial and also the Colonial Hotel in La Jolla. And he was also just finishing up a remodel of the Foreign Club in Tijuana. Hotel commercial was built, uh, mimicking the top floors of that, that design that we saw. He featured brickwork similar to the new Pickwick Hotel, which is now the Sofia Hotel down in San Diego. Gonzalez wanted a restaurant on the ground floor of his new commercial, just like at his Ensenada location, prefer preferably with less murdery tenants. Uh, Paul Della Maggiora moved uh, and the new restaurant was the Fior di Italia into the new building and built up white a clientele. When Alex Cardini came on as Paul Majora's partner, uh, they became celebrities in their own right. Guests associated the place with its lively host and simply called the restaurant Paul and Alex's. Uh, this is um, Paul here, and uh, that is Alex there at the bar. Its moody hunting lodge interiors were designed by La Jolla architect Edgar Vaughn Ulrich who did the Casa de Manana Hotel in La Jolla. The restaurant centered around a large fireplace and dance floor like Majora's previous gig at Ye Alpine Tavern. It had hewn wood beams, dark wood bar, rustic plastered walls, Lombardy coats of arms adorned the arches and booths. They served fine Piedmontese Italian food and wild game. And it had a famous wine cellar, extensive enough to bring, quote, scalding tears to the eyes of a crusader, end quote. And we're talking about an anti-alcohol crusader. Live jazz music band, bands, dancing, uh, El Charo music, mariachis. There was a place, their place was reviewed as the best among good restaurants in town. Uh, one writer, Edson Waite, paid a visit and reported it was a charming place. Mighty comfortable, homey and beautiful, a most difficult combination to achieve. I know of no other restaurant quite like it. Paul prepared a signature duck a la presse and crepe Suzette from a rolling cart. It was his thing, there it is right there, the duck press. And here's uh, his menu cover he'd later um, own a place called Paul's Duck Press, where you could actually bring in your game from your hunting trips and he'd cook it up for you. Uh, duck Press, of course, is uh, you cook the duck press and you take the bones and stuff and you crush them up and all the extra parts and the blood and juices come out and you mix that with cognac and all sorts of fun stuff for the sauce. It's quite a show and it is quite delicious if you like duck. Uh, Paul and Alex's, here actually you can see some mariachis there, or El Charo, troubadours they called them. Possessed of a fine singing voice, Alex, it was written with Cardini. 
while serving his guests might break out the famous operatic ar aria from Pagliacci or Rigoletto. It became a gathering place for the great and near great, the millionaire sportsman, statesman, W.C. Fields, James Cagney, Clark Gable, Rudolph Valentino, uh, the dancers Eduardo and his daughter uh, Margarita Cancino, who would later, uh, when, she, when she went to Hollywood, be renamed Rita Hayward. They went there. It was a place at which to dine, dance, and be seen. Um, the restaurateurs were immersed in the local community. Alex promoted boxing events, and Paul went flying and sheep hunting with Wallace Beery in the Baja Mountains. Oh, um, but there are newspaper advertisements from this time from the separate establishments of Cesar Cardini's Caesar's Place, Paul Majora's Fiore d'Italia, Alex Cardini's Alex Place, sometimes just called Alex Cafe, Alex Cardini and Johnny Montepagano's Alex John Bar. Uh, is it too many cooks in the kitchen or what? Common threads in this, this short, these short lived uh, partnerships were the frequent Tijuana fires, rebuilding, and the Cardini brothers. In his late 30s, Caesar was ready to open his own place, though, probably the dream he'd had since he was a kid uh, in Canada. He'd been in the hospitality industry for over 20 years, and he knew how, as the old ad went. Hotel Caesar's place. Now known simply as Hotel Caesar, this is it before it was all built up like it is today. Uh, it would be a safe hotel, fireproof, bigger and better than Mariano Escobedo's California Hotel. Uh, one where Tijuana tourists could come and ignore the 6 p.m. border closures and stay the whole night. Yeah, in order to try and stop people from drinking, even going over the border, they closed the borders at 6 p.m. Didn't work. It had to have a first class restaurant, like at the Palace Hotel with the best food, imported wines from the mother country and entertainment. Caesar went into business with his past co worker, Joe Ferraris, whom we met and worked uh, at, at the San Francisco Palace Hotel, and a developer, Clement or Clemente Monaco. Hotel Caesars Place had its soft opening on Christmas Day, 1930. And then its grand opening uh, was on March 14th, 1931. And if you think about it, last week, the hotel celebrated its 90th anniversary. Congratulations. This place had an outdoor patio. They called it the Italian patio. It had an attached gift shop and liquor store where they could sell their imports. Waiters in tuxedos ready to serve your dishes and salad from rolling carts. In June, in June 1933, Alex left Paul and Alex's partnership to help his brother enlarge Caesar's Hotel. So in a couple of years, they wanted to enlarge it. Here, Alex is in the kitchen at Caesars, and I'm not sure if that's Godenzio on the right, it might be. Paul Majora uh, assumed entire management of the hotel commercial in Alex's absence, uh, in addition to the restaurant. And uh, instead of Alex and Paul's, or Paul and Alex's, it was then known again as the Fiore di Italia. Caesars was, and still is, primarily an Italian restaurant, more continental than Mexican. Uh, while the uh, Cardini brothers came from classic French cooking uh, backgrounds in Europe and San Francisco, their food was influenced by their Piedmont roots and regional Mexican traditions. Alex cooked in Mexico for decades, uh, cuisine that, flavored, uh, that favored strong flavors, garlic, cheeses, spices, seafood, wild game, I like to say that theirs was the original Baja Med. Uh, there's Bohemian Night, uh, Alex, now with Caesars. Hotel Caesars Place, hotel rates from $2 to $4. Meet Alex at Caesars. Originally, um, he was there at Caesars, but uh, prior to the opening, 
of San Francisco's 1935 California Pacific International Exposition. And it's eagerly anticipating crowd of tourists. Cardini split with the Hotel Caesars Place partners, Joe and Clement. Cardini, Cardini then set up his own shop with his brothers, Alex, Nero, and Gaudenzio up the street in the Hotel Commercial with his original Caesars Place. He called it original Caesars Place. They remodeled the old Paul and Alex's, uh, added some murals by Mexican artists and even renamed the commercial hotel to Hotel Caesar. So Saturday, uh, October 34 was its formal opening uh, and the Cardini brothers owned original Caesars Place Hotel and Restaurant. And uh, it was also the formal opening of Club Stiliano in San Diego which was run by Alex's ex-partner, Paul Majora. So he went over there. Now there were two Caesars in, San, in, in Tijuana, but the Cardini's place next to Mexicali's beers, uh, La Ballena Long Bar, um, with its large welcoming signs was the first that tourists would see. Uh, Caesar was known for his nightly floor shows. And he took the, uh, artists and acts with him from Caesar's Hotel to his original Caesar's place. Entertainment of, of all, all kinds. Um, it happened in the Fiesta dining room, the wine cellar, uh, fine Italian Mexican food. They had duck a la press, wild game, and of course, Caesar's table side salad. Um, lunches for 50 or 75 cents actually, it went up, included wine. One dollar dinners included cocktails. They made a killing on booze in their gift shops, imported directly by Caesar. One moment while I let the cat in, he's meowing at the door. Come in and shut up. Now there were two Caesars, right? Nightly fiestas featured the music of Otilio. Uh, Rivera's dance band, uh, Sopranos, Mexican City's opera tenor, uh, Jose de Ariata, and uh, baritone, Jose Mercado, Carla Montel's fire dance, all sorts of entertainment. Pierre White was the MC. This is the building today. For 12 years down in the Devil's Playground, Caesar and Alex had flamboyantly catered to the whims of a Hollywood royalty, sports stars, mobsters, politicians. Uh, Mexican president Eduardo Rodriguez offered Alex to establish and run a food service program for the Hotel Garci Crespo. And he took the job in Tehuacan. Um, Alex took the job and Alex went there, looked it over, decided to buy a whole bunch of stuff for the place, and he returned to work with Caesar, Nero, and Cadenzio in Tijuana. The reunion, however, was brief. The brothers had a falling out, most probably because of the Tamil Khan situation. Alex left that partnership for his new venture, where he would remain for 14 years. Um, with the Mexican government outlawing gambling, the end of prohibition and the newly legalized horse racing in the United States, tourism came to a screeching halt. Business went black. By 1936, Caesar quit all of his businesses in Tijuana. He was disgusted and naturally thought of Hollywood for his next venture. It never materialized, but San Diego boosters convinced him to move back to San Diego and open Caesar Cardini Cafe, which he did at Front and B Streets downtown. Lobster Thermidor, as only Caesar knows how to prepare. Unfortunately, that one uh, lasted less than a year and was closed when the mob, the local mob, run by the Mirabile brothers, uh, threatened his musicians and their families, allegedly. Uh, Caesar Cardini Cafe officially opened uh, September 18th, 1936, to a capacity crowd. Caesar used his Tijuana connections to bring lively entertainment to this new establishment, but with a hipper, jazzier, jazzier 
a higher class vibe. Floor shows, singers, dancers, swing bands, neon signs, art deco advertisements for society's favorite, Cesar Cardini Cafe. Heavily saturated, the newspapers. The orchestra, orchestra pit was uh, tucked up in a balcony overlooking the large dance floor. Cardini engaged the Jay Eastlick band, his orchestra, with uh, Jay Eastlick as master of ceremonies. He had just finished a long engagement at dapper mobster Paul Mirabile's nearby cafe, Paul's Cafe. Uh, what is it with the names? He was very popular all around, uh, Jay Eastwick. He was a drinking buddy, a Bing Crosby type. He actually did drink with Bing Crosby. Paul Mirabile played uh, the legit businessman, but his brother Tony, well, he came from Detroit and was known as Papa Tony. Among others, uh, he owned the Midnight Frolics in Tijuana, and they knew, they knew the Cardinians. His specialty was loan sharking, and when the tech clients couldn't pay their uh, high rates, he'd reduce the balance due for a percentage of the uh, business. At one time, the Mirabiles uh, said they wanted to own a piece of every bar and club in San Diego. Uh, this bar and restaurant was owned by uh, Caesar and his wife, Camille. Um, she actually was the owner on record because he hadn't been uh, naturalized. Uh, when they applied for their license, um, city councilman tried to say she wasn't eligible and they were going to try and deny it because she was married to an alien, a foreigner, and thus uh, reneged her citizenship. She put a short notice of that and successfully uh, put them in their place and went on to uh, help him, Caesar run all of his businesses. In fact, she's the one that was a musician in the family and um, booked most of the musical acts. The ground floor uh, featured high-backed Inglenook booths, uh, tables, and counter service. Upstairs was a cocktail lounge and banquet hall. Uh, he, Cardini had enjoyed offering a very large and extensive wine and spirit selection at all his ventures. Um, they had mixed drinks before six o'clock, 25 cents each. And now that's a happy hour, right? Classic French and Italian cuisine was featured, of course, with the wild game specials, Lobster Thermidor. Um, and then in an ad, he said his royal chef uh, was the one that was preparing things, not mentioned by name, uh, but it could have been Nero or Gaudenzio. Oh because they were both uh, in Tijuana and they were both around in San Diego at the same time. Uh, with everything going for it, how come it didn't last? Showman that he was, uh, he was not the best businessman. He bowed to pressure from homegrown mobsters, let's just say, that didn't want the competition. Uh, in November, Cardini's musicians were threatened. Uh, one even at his own home, they came to his front door and said, you don't want your little girl to be harmed, would you? All the musicians quit and his business closed. And after that, he immediately went into a succession of partnerships, short running the Tavern Hacienda in downtown San Diego, the Beacon Inn in Cardiff. And in 1938, he and brother Gaudenzio opened up uh, Caesar's large home, seen here in Chula Vista, for private functions, the Caesar Cardini uh, Villa. It's a national historic monument, or Chula Vista, I should say, historic monument now, uh, serving 50 cent meals. By, uh, by 1939, Cardini had given up on San Diego and moved north to his uh, Los Angeles uh, proprietor of Montclair. Um, liquor store. He bottled his salad dressing and, as recollected by his daughter Rose, Rosa, sold it from the back of their station wagon at farmer's markets. He ultimately ended up with his own store at La Siena, you know, La Siena uh, Boulevard. Uh, people would come in and uh, buy his salad dressing. Someone would bring empty bottles and have them filled. His daughter Rosa trademarked the name after his death in 1954 and eventually 
uh, grew the salad dressing business uh, into a multi-million dollar concern. She died in San Diego, actually. Um, and so she was local as well. After this stint in Tehuacan, um, Alex ran uh, the restaurant in the Hotel Palacio Tropical in Acapulco. Uh, and then in 1954, he returned to Tijuana to run the New Highlight Cafe. Um, and then he went on in 67 um, to be featured in a popular ad campaign for Braniff Airlines. They, they had a, a huge advertising campaign for gourmet food service. Um, then, ever busy, he remained in, in Mexico, ultimately running several continental restaurants. The, the one that lasted the longest was Cardini's in Mexico City, and Gaudenzio joined him for a while there until Gaudenzio uh, returned to Bavena, where he ran a restaurant until the 1980s. Alex's son, Alex Cardini II, continued on as does his son, Alex Cesar Cardini III in Mexico City. Uh, Caesar's big plans for opening that hot night club in Hollywood, they never uh, materialized, but his name lives on in Caesar salad. Uh, his Caesar's restaurants in Tijuana continued on after he left um, Caesar's, Hotel Caesar's. Uh, was still run by Clement Monaco and Joe Ferraris. Um, they actually ran newspaper ads saying that they were still open even though he left. Uh, and then it was taken over by Kisai Galakian and it is still run by the Avakian family, Armando Avakian. And let's get on to a couple more of, of the pretenders. Pat Gisico. Born Pasquale Giuseppe DeSico. Um, he actually was married, he married Gloria Vanderbilt. Uh, people were telling her that uh, maybe you shouldn't uh, marry this guy. You know, he uh, he probably killed his first first wife, Thelma Todd. She did die supposedly of a suicide, but everyone thought it was him. He was prone to violent outbreaks as well, and he called her ugly, among other things. Uh, Howard Hughes wanted to marry her, uh, but DeSico worked for Howard Hughes. So Howard Hughes sent him on some bullshit job to get rid of him and tried to uh, marry her, but she ended up marrying the bad boy, DeSico himself. Uh, he went into the army. Uh, then when he came back, he became the manager for the House of Murphy restaurant in, uh, in LA. Here's a 1945 Victor menu where they have the Caesar salad, but they're calling it the Salad de Murphy. So when DeSico came back, um, he had been introduced to the salad by some reporters that loved the Caesar and they had introduced these salads to the LA places. Um, he decided he wanted to make it his own. So it was later called the DeSico salad. Here's a 1945 menu later. Um, the salad bar special, DeSico salad, it's made the same way, but only with his name on it. Um, here's the wine list. This is Bob Murphy, the owner, and he only got a haircut once a year, whether he needed it or not. Here's a brochure uh, that they used to give out uh, with, the, uh, with the menu, uh, with the uh, re recipe for DeSico salad. Sometimes he spelled his name D-E, sometimes D-I. Uh, but basically it's the same, same recipe, but with his name on it. Then there's this guy, Prince Michael Romanov. Actually, he, he built himself as Prince Michael Dmitry Alexandrovich Oblensky Romanov, Russian royalty. Everybody went to his place. But in reality, his name was Herschel Gaguzin. Here's a menu cover of his place and he served the Romanov salad, which was basically Caesar's salad. He was a Lithuanian immigrant. His real name was Herschel Gagusin, but he also went by Harry Gergeson, Prince Michael Dmitry Alexandrovich Lipolinsky Romanov, like I said. Uh, he was in reality a Brooklyn tailor, an actor, a con man who convinced 
everybody that he was of royal lineage and for decades had a most exclusive restaurant. The Hollywood in crowd swarmed with Shishi Beverly Hills place. Uh, the Caesar salad, this is quoted, which Mike Romanoff will let you have at a sacrifice only two bucks is glorified garlic, wrote Broadway columnist Earl Wilson in 1947. It's garlic with glamour. Uh, Wilson smuggled the recipe from Romanoff's while on a trip to Hollywood. Wilson was an extra in Moni Poser's film Copacabana, where Carmen Miranda sang to him in a scene. Tomorrow we'll see the rushes, they said. What are rushes? A, produ a producer answered him, well, in your case, they're called rushes because you rush in to see them and we rush right out again. And Caesar salad. It's a Cardini family thing, basically. They all contributed. Caesar, Alex Godenzio, Nero, Caesar's daughter, uh, Rosa, Alex's son and grandson. And I'll end with this photo of the Alex Cardini family posing in front of their cuisine at Cardini's restaurant in Mexico City. There's Alex Cardini, uh, his sons Roberto and Alex Jr. And Alex Cardini the third. Uh, I had to crop this photo a little bit, but down at the bottom, there's a whole bunch of bottles of Caesar salad dressing. And no matter how your allegiances fall, in the Caesar salad fight. It's good to remember that those Italian families who came to Mexico and America with their rich traditions and Piedmontese cuisine uh, left a, a lasting culinary legacy that we enjoy to this day. And I'm grateful for that. And hopefully you've enjoyed this, this talk and so ends the story of the two Caesars. And there will be recipes posted on chsandiego.org and classicsandiego.com. Thank you. Now I'll stop the share. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. okay. All right. You've got um, you've got a couple of comments. Okay. Uh, a couple of people had um, Jacobs and Ed Long had trouble getting in uh, via Eventbrite, so we should look into that for next time. Oh, definitely. It's yeah, uh, they had to try a different route. And uh, <clears throat> when Carriage wrote in with um, a, can of, a quoting Kenabala, uh, Albala, the, um, the correct pronunciation of Apicius is Apixius. Apixius, thank you, thank you. According to Ken. This is what book learning will do to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Jacobs, um, would like that you've mentioned this and I, you, you've mentioned it a couple of times uh, since he uh, put this uh, in, but uh, your mushroom sauce is going, the recipe for that is going to be uh, one of the recipes. Yes, it is actually uh, online on uh, classic, uh, classicsanigo.com, my website, but it's also online. I put it on the event page of culinary historians. So chsandiego.org and go to the event page and it's down if you scroll to the bottom of the page. Um, uh, Joyce wanted to know, no, okay, now to the questions. Uh, <laughs> Joyce wanted to know why were so many Italians enamored by Mexico? And I know after she asked this question, you did, um, uh, you did uh, explain that in many ways, but you might want to just uh, add something to that. Oh yeah, well, to reiterate, um, Baja California has a very temperate Mediterranean climate, which is akin to Spain or places like that. So there's also that. Uh, a lot of Mexicans, uh, I mean, Italians came there because of the opportunities in Mexico. Um, also, um, like I said before, uh, prohibition again, 
as a good answer because um, they all dealt with fine cuisine, wine, spirits like that, and they couldn't make any money uh, in, in the United States during prohibition. So a lot of it was um, coming over there to, to, um, to Mexico for that as well. Also getting away from the bad situation in Mexico at the time, there was a large immigration to Italy at that time. I mean, to Mexico at that time from Italy and all over the place actually. So hopefully that kind of answers it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, I also see um, B2 asks, what can be used instead of anchovies? Uh, Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce is made with uh, anchovies. So if you don't like um, that super strong anchovy taste, you can use Worcestershire sauce. And if you, even if that's too, uh, too strong, I suppose you can um, water it down with a little something, but that's, that's, that's what, that's what uh, most people would do. And that's what most of the recipes have. Um, also, some people add mustard into it as well. I see uh, a couple people are saying that, um, that they use mustard seed or mustard in it. Even um, in some of the restaurants now, they use uh, French mustard as well to give it a little extra zing, which I kind of like in it as well. Um, and how long did it take to research this presentation? Well, let me tell you, I've been working on this for about five or six years. Oh, uh, and I'm still not done because there's still unanswered questions. Uh, there's a couple people down in Mexico as well. I'd like to thank Armando Avakian, who is the owner of uh, Caesars. has a wealth of information. Uh, he's, uh, you know, discovering new things all the time through his research, but also going to his, his father's office at the Hotel Caesar. He keeps finding great stuff. Some of the photos that I used here are from his research. Thank you, Armando. Um, yeah, so that's been quite, quite a, a long haul, but interesting nevertheless. Um, how close is the currently commercially available Cardinis to the original recipe? Uh, the original uh, is fresh and, and nice and vibrant. The Cardinis uh, taste a little bit like it, um, but you know, it's got extra stuff in it and preservatives. So it's also, I think the recipe has been changed over the years and commoditized. Um, I think we need to do a taste test and find out. Let's see. Um, also, with the emphasis of Italy regarding on the origin of the Caesar salad, it might also be worth noting that today, March 20th, is also known as National Ravioli Day. Thank you, Bruce. I did not know that. This is perfect. So go out and buy that, um, buy all the ingredients and make the brown mushroom sauce. It'll only take you about 16 hours if you're gonna do the, uh, uh, um, the stock from scratch. Um, but National Ravioli Day, yum. Um, let's see, excellent pictures, thank you. And, Okay, and then Karen says, for locals, when it is safe to do so, it is also a great treat to have uh, for a hand-tossed salad at the original Caesars restaurant. History continues. Yes, it is. It is good. It's delicious. And it's fun to see the original guys down there doing it. Um, in fact, uh, Armando Viegas is one of the Ensaladeros there, and he's a great, I mean, he's been doing it for, what, 30 some years, or maybe even longer, right? Um, Sorry, uh, Martin, I have lost you. My screen went blank with no warning. I saw uh, that. I, uh, I'm okay, have, I think. I, I think, think I you can handle it after your excellent presentation. <laughs> you 
you can, there were a bunch more chat questions and uh, um, oh, I should look in the chat. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, is this first? So let's see what else. Any connection to Romesco's in Bonita? Susan Riley says, yes, there is. Romesco's serves as Caesar's, Caesar's salad, and Romesco's is owned by the Placencia family who runs Caesar's uh, restaurant in the hotel, Caesar's. So there you go. And oh yes, Daryl Floman says the original Caesar's dressing had five main ingredients. The bottled version currently has more than 17. Yes, this is true. This is true. So just make it yourself. Uh, and if you're afraid of the egg situation, think of this. Um, uh, back then they probably used more of a country style egg as opposed to large commoditized eggs that we have. And we're all afraid of eggs now. Uh, you shouldn't really be afraid of your food, but at the same time, don't use raw eggs. What you should do is coddle them for 60 seconds in boiling water. And coddling is just placing it in there and boiling it, which is disinfecting the outside and heating it up and basically pasteurizing it a little bit. And, uh, that's the reason they do it, you know, because you never know how dirty an egg is on the outside. It's gonna be pure on the inside because it's encased, but uh, the egg itself on the outside, do that and you'll be okay. And that's what makes it creamy when you mix it with the lemon juice and all the other stuff in there, it gets all creamy and you slowly add the olive oil into it. I was gonna post a video, but I wasn't sure if it was gonna break everything, but uh, you can actually see some videos pretty easily. By uh, going going online. Um, so yes, to answer the question, Romesco's is owned by the same people. Um, and then uh, let's see, any other questions in the chat? I don't think so. I think we I think you covered them. Okay. In my brief. Uh, can we anticipate a tale of two Caesars book? Only. Only if you want to read more in more excruciating detail about every detail, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, details in this. And even then I didn't talk about a lot of the stuff. It's like uh, most of the stories you'll hear about all the stars that go to these restaurants. And that's kind of repeating the same stuff over and over again, because they all went down there. Uh, I didn't really talk about uh, Agua Caliente Resort you know, opening up and taking business away from all of the restaurants. And I did talk about the fires, but there were so many fires. That they kept, everybody's places kept burning down because no one could get insurance down there. And you just had basically had to start. And when the fires happened, you know, uh, they'd run out of water and I just have to let the place burn. And Tijuana back in the twenties was a town of 2000 people. You know, it was tiny, so. There you go. But anyway, I want to thank everybody. We want to thank you. That was um, <clears throat> it was rich, full of information, um, and um, it was just so entertaining. One of my favorite things about uh, programming um, and the great people we have who come to present is that it um, it's always. It's enlightening, yes, but it's very entertaining as well. And boy, you hit the mark with both of those things. Too. Oh, good. So, good. And I, I'm sorry about the cat. He always does that when he hears me talking. Uh, I have a windows open so I could hear it. He's like, oh, there we go. Napoleon, stop it. <laughs> anyway. Oh, Napoleon just added charm to the whole thing. Thank so, you. Thank you, Martin. And again, um, don't forget to come April, come back to see us uh, April 17th. Um, check our website for registration and you'll get more information. For those of you who are on our email list, um, you will get that uh, toward the end of the, the period before then. Um, but, um, but, and if you'd like to be on our email list, please do let us know through info at Culinary Historians or membership member at culinaryhistorians.org. Um, and just send us a note. We'll get, get you all signed up. Um, so thank everybody for coming. Look forward to see Jim Chevalier uh, April 17th, talking about feasting with the Franks, the history of French food.
All right. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see you all. We'll see you all later. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.